Hello, Stitchers. Welcome to Stitch Please, the official podcast of Black Women's Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. I'm your host, Lisa Woolfork. I'm a fourth generation sewing enthusiast with more than 20 years of sewing experience. I am looking forward to today's conversation. So sit back, relax, and get ready to get your stitch together. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Stitch Please podcast. I am your host, Lisa Woolfork, joining you from Charlottesville, Virginia. And I know I say this every episode, but we are talking with an amazingly special and wonderful person today and something we have talked about a little bit, but not enough, in my opinion, and that is the ancestral practices of quilt making and of quilting. This woman that we are going to speak to today, it's hard to summarize, Sarah Bond and all that she does and brings and represents. Not only is she a fantastic quilter in her own right with 40 years of quilting practice under her belt, she also is a megaphone in some ways for her ancestors. She is the person who is keeping these stories alive. She has that rare ability that many Black folks, speaking for myself, are denied in terms of tracing back her ancestors to a particular moment with a particular people and a set of circumstances, and not only knowing their story, but having access to the art that they created in quilting. So she's here and she's got a brand new exhibit that's going to be coming out in the show starting at the Schweinfurth in upstate New York. It's called Threads Across Time. And this is why the episode is called Threads Across Time because Sarah Bond is bringing these threads across time. She is helping to shape the past, present, and preserve the future of quilting. And we are honored to have her here today. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much, Lisa. I'm so thrilled to be here. This is such a delight. I am super excited. We know that you are a quilt maker with lots of experience. We know that you specialize in traditional, but also with this gorgeous modern touch. Can you talk a bit about how you got started? I read that 1979 was a big year for you and the beginning of your quilting career. Can you talk a bit more about that? In 1979, I made my first quilt. That first quilt was made in an era when we didn't have rotary cutters and mats and big rulers. I made this quilt with cardboard and a pencil and some scissors and an old sewing machine. And I used fabric that I had left over from garments that I had made. I was sitting in the sewing room or the guest room in my house. My mother came in and she said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm making a quilt. And she said, why? And I said, I'm not really sure exactly why, but I really feel like I need to make this quilt. I feel this is my mission this summer. It was a summer between years in college. I was determined. And so I made this quilt, pieced it all together and sandwiched it with that lovely 1979 polyester batting and hand quilted it and took it back to school with me in the fall. I didn't really know at that time when I was making this quilt, I didn't really know all of the stories about quilting in my family, but I still felt this push, this creative encouragement from somewhere to make this quilt. We were speaking earlier and you identify yourself as a self-taught quilter. This was before, long before YouTube, there was no YouTube, long before there were books and everyone had a, a book or techniques or special rulers or like you said, rotary cutters, even like in terms of the sewing industry, like home sergers, for example, these things weren't there either. It was a different time. And yet you managed to create a beautiful quilt and felt this kind of knock at your heart saying, hey, you can do this. Can you talk a bit more about that? As I was growing up, there were quilts on the beds and I I didn't really think that much about it. My mother had a, a double wedding ring quilt on her bed and there was an applique quilt that looked like a Carolina lily on the guest room bed. Um, And there were various quilts on beds in the house. And I never really knew, you know, who had made them. Where were they from? I asked my father eventually about it. And he said that his grandmother, Luvinia, had made these quilts. Eventually, I got the story between talking to him and also I did some stuff on Ancestry. And actually, it's amazing when you know a little bit how much you can actually find. And so Luvinia was born in 1858. It really wasn't until a couple of years ago that it struck me that she was 
born in 1858 and I was born in 1958. So here we are exactly one century apart working together on these quilts. Luvinia had two daughters, Bertha and Rosabelle. Rosabelle was my father's mother. I never knew Lavinia. She died in 1943, but I did know Rosabelle. The whole story that my father told me was that Rosabelle and Luvinia didn't really get along that well. And Rosabelle always felt that Luvinia preferred Bertha, who was the older sister. So when Luvinia died, Rosabelle went over and got all the quilts before Bertha could get there. And so there were these quilts on the beds that I had known, but little did I know that when we went to clean out the basement that we would find another 10 quilts down there that had been made by Luvinia or maybe people before Luvinia. It was like my father was still hiding them from Bertha. It's so funny how these things in families persist, even if they're not completely intentional. But there were those quilts down there. And my mother called me. I grew up in Chicago. And after my father died, she moved to Philadelphia. And as she was cleaning the house out, she called me and she said, hey, I found all these ratty quilts in the basement. You don't want these, do you? And I said, okay, you need to back away from those quilts, put them in a nice box and bring them with you because I need to have those quilts. And there were a whole bunch of them. And a couple of the ones that I found most striking were these Lone Star quilts that Luvinia had made. And one of the things that really impressed me about them is, you know, you hear all these stories about how quilts were made from necessity and women cut things up and there was really no design process at all. They were just trying to keep people warm. But what struck me about these things that she made is that they were so clearly a product of love and an expression, a, I mean, from a iron will to express herself because, I mean, a woman born in 1858, born into slavery, lived in the South her whole life, Orangeburg, South Carolina, uh, clearly, I mean, I'm not saying she had a terrible life, but I'm sure she had challenges. And yet within all of this, she managed to put together these just amazing quilts. And so I decided at, at one point that I wanted to spend some time working in a series around these quilts. And so I made a bunch of Lone Star quilts and then I started to sort of deconstruct them from a design perspective. So I made one quilt where the points instead of pointing out are pointing towards the center of the quilt. And so that was my inverted star. And then I made one where the blades of the star are sort of dancing across the quilt laterally rather than being in a circle. And then I moved from that by taking those blades that are at those angles and splitting those rows of diamonds apart. So they're just sort of following each other in two different directions down the quilt. So I worked on these for a while and it was really amazing to me again, just like in 1979, you know, I felt like, I mean, she wasn't speaking words to me, but there was a communication and it made me feel full that we were both working on these same quilts and her name would be repeated again now, a hundred years later, because of this work. And I love that when you when you mentioned about her name would still be spoken, because I think that forgetting is so harmful. It can feel so violent to be erased from memory is so destructive. And it's harmful because the folks who come afterward could really benefit from knowing that there was someone that came before because it makes you feel like less isolated. And so when you talked about that you were able to see the artistry in her work, and what I appreciate about that with you, because I agree, anyone born in 1858 is going to have challenges that are incredibly different from anyone born in 1958. That's just history. Like so much has changed between these two time periods. But for Black folks, a lot of things are similar. And so this notion that I was just talking with someone about this, that the idea of leisure time and like who is allowed to have leisure, who is allowed to do things just for the joy and love of them rather than turning them into an income stream or a revenue generating thing, right? That, oh, no, no, you're too poor to create beautiful things. You're too marginalized to express yourself through the creative arts. Instead, you should be bootstrapping yourself to death. You know, work as hard as you can every minute of the day until you can get another little tiny corner of the capitalist crumbs. And it just shows us that even for Black women born in 1858, 
that had like no rights. They legally had no rights compared to what we have today still managed to design a quilt with something beautiful in mind. That is such a radical act. And it is. There's a quote by Bell Hooks, and I can't recall it verbatim, but when she was speaking about her grandmother and quilting and how her grandmother took to this craft and she, you know, spent her fair share of time working on it, her grandmother said that that was an opportunity after spending all the time keeping house and having children and teaching children and clothing children and raising children and caring for elders and caring for spouses and and all of those things that are women's work, that the quilting with her and the group of women that she quilted with, that was the time when she could come back to herself and speak to herself and speak to her own needs. How quilting was not just a utilitarian thing or just an activity or a hobby. It was really this coming back to oneself and spending time to know oneself. I mean, clearly we're still doing that today because that's the time we take for ourselves and don't talk to me, I'm quilting, you know? It's still the same. Again, this idea that I think in our day and age here speaking in 2021, that capitalism has somehow distorted into a self-care industry right? That you can get a box for self-care. You can buy a shampoo for self-care. But what your ancestors have demonstrated is, and like as Bell Hooks was talking about her own grandmother's quilts, is that in a world that is so deliberately hostile, in a world where your boundaries, your limitations are forced upon you externally, either through slavery, through Black codes, through Jim Crow, through all of these other things that American racism throws up, right? To prevent Black people from having mobility. The one thing we have always been able to control is our own thoughts and our own hearts and our own vision. The genius to recognize and allow for finding ways to deliberately care for ourselves is just a strategy for thriving in a world that wasn't built for you to do that. And the amazing thing about quilts and quilting is that those quilts are the physical manifestation of that struggle and that victory. The physical manifestation. And you have them. You can touch something that was made by someone who was born in 1858. But also before that, because you said that you were talking earlier about your ancestor, Jane Arthur Bond, like the the first person who has been recorded in your family history, her being held or enslaved by this family. Could you talk a little bit about that, about how you discovered your prime ancestor and the work that she did? Absolutely. And this was completely by mistake. You know, I took up quilting and uh, then, as one does, began to accumulate fabric and books. And back then it was a little bit different because there wasn't the Internet and we weren't on Facebook sites or anything like that. So you would walk into a fabric store or a quilt shop and you'd look in the bargain bin to see what the books were. Or you'd go to the bookstore and find the four or five books on quilting that were in the whole store. And so I found this book. It's called Stitched from the Soul and it's by Gladys Marie Fry. And it's all about quilts that were made by slaves. And so I was looking through this book and all of a sudden I see Jane Arthur Bond. And I said, now, wait a minute. I knew about Jane. I knew that she was our matriarch. She had two sons, James and Henry. And in our family, you're either a James or you're a Henry. I'm a Henry. Henry was my great grandfather. And so I knew about Jane, but I didn't know this quilting story about Jane. And so I'm looking through this book and looking at these quilts and there's this picture of Jane and she's fixing the hair of this young white girl. Then there are these pictures of these quilts. And it turns out that this young girl in the 1880s or whatever was a diarist and she wrote about her everyday life. And one of the things she wrote about was Aunt Jane. And she wrote about how Jane made quilts with her mother, Rebecca. And there were these pictures of these quilts. I was astonished because I, you know, I knew I was interested in quilts. I really didn't know anything about any other family history about quilts. I hadn't gotten schooled on Louvini at this point. I said, this is fascinating. And where are these quilts? Because I've never seen these quilts. 
I don't know anybody who has these quilts. So I wrote to the author and asked, where are these quilts? And she never wrote me back. And I thought, wow, that's really irritating. Then in the course of life, my family has these reunions, right? My first reunion I went to in 1996, and I met lots of family that, you know, I hadn't met before. And, you know, in the course of discussion and whatever, it came up that Emma was the person in our family who did all of this genealogy. You know, she kept up with these things. And, and, you know, again, even then, it wasn't, oh, let me log on to Ancestry.com. It was, you know, you're on this message board and you're messaging back and forth with people. I don't even know. But she made contact with this woman, Catherine, who was the granddaughter of the girl in that picture. And come to find out subsequently, this woman knew all about Preston. I mean, people on our side knew about Preston too, but she knew all about Preston because that was her great, great, whatever. You know, she referred to him as the rapist because he was. So I guess I did not say that Jane was born in 1828 in Anderson County, Kentucky. And she was given as a wedding gift in 1848 to Belinda, who was the daughter of the family. And she went with Belinda when Belinda married Preston Bond. And we know that Preston fathered at least two children with James, who was born in 1863, and Henry, who was my great-grandfather, was born in 1865. And Henry was the first one in our family who was born a free person, because even though James was born after the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation only applied to slaves in Confederate states, and Kentucky was not a Confederate state. So anyway, I looked in this book, and I talked with Emma about it, and she said, oh, well, I know this woman who knows the genealogy on that side, and turns out she is the granddaughter of this girl, and she has all the quilts. So I think it was in, oh gosh, maybe 2004, I I can't remember, 2002, but Emma and Catherine, you know, talked back and forth and Catherine sent one of Jane's quilts, one of these quilts that she had to one of our reunions for us to, you know, sort of commune with or to send it back. But she sent this quilt and that's the first time that I ever touched anything that Jane made. So I made it my business to know this woman. I flew down to Florida and visited her and these quilts and I invited her to our reunion in 2008, which I hosted in Philadelphia. So she came up and she brought this basket quilt and she offered it to auction to support the reunion. And I got it. So I now own that quilt, which is so amazing. And so what is the date on that quilt? Is there any like way to estimate about when you think your ancestor made that quilt? Is there any way to tell a year or anything? Well, I talked with a couple of people. I talked with Liz Porter from Fonz and Porter. So I took this class at the Quilt Fest in Philadelphia with her. And I took the book with me and I said, you know, what about this quilt and blah, 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 blah. And she looked at it and she said, because the photograph in the book, it's hard to tell what the pattern of the quilt is because different parts of the pattern faded differently. So you could tell that she used different kinds of blues and different kinds of reds because some of them faded out completely and some of them were still there. So by looking at the various different blocks in the quilt, she helped me figure out that this was a basket quilt. I actually did remake that quilt in red and blue shui shui, then offered that at one of our subsequent reunions. So a cousin of mine has that quilt now. That's how I found out sort of what the pattern was. And then subsequently, I took another class with a historian of fabric and quilts. So I talked with her and she said, I know this book says antebellum quilts, but this quilt based on the fabric is from sometime in the 1880s. And that follows with what I know. She made this with Rebecca after the end of the war. And she went back and she worked for Rebecca. I'm thinking somewhere 1880, 1885, something like that. It's absolutely amazing. And as your family is moving through, so we talked about Jane and this wonderful matriarch that you have and you know her story. You know that she was a woman who was owned by a rapist and that this is something that was incredibly common during that time period. And as you get forward, though, I keep thinking about your other ancestor, Ruth Clement Bond from 1934, like that quilt. 
I have to be clear, Ruth was not, she's not a direct line to me, but I always have to include her because her work was so amazing. She, you know, had an amazing life of seeking social justice and all kinds of, I mean, she was, even without any quilts, she was amazing. Black Women Stitch and the Stitch Please podcast are happy to announce that we have another way to connect with our community. In addition to the IG Lives that we do every Thursday at 3 p.m., we also now have a club on Clubhouse. That's right, friends. They done messed up and given me the chance to have a club. Follow Black Women Stitch on Instagram and now on Clubhouse Thursdays at 3 p.m. on Instagram and 3.45 p.m. on Clubhouse Eastern Standard Time. And we'll help you get your stitch together. Her husband worked with building the dam. And even in Chicago, even in the North or the West or in certain places, that segregation required that you couldn't have black and white folks building a dam together. Goodness forbid if that happened. So Ruth's husband supervised the black workers. The quilt that she made, I mean, that oh, I don't know, I, w- I would love to see it. Could you show us again? I think you might have showed it. So here is the picture of Ruth and Ruth married Max. Max was one of Jane's grandsons. So he got his PhD in sociology, maybe, at the University of Chicago sometime in the 20s, late 20s. And he got a job in 1934, I think, supervising the workers at the Tennessee Valley Authority. And so he supervised the workers and Ruth went with him and she worked with the women in the camps where they lived. And She was not a quilter herself. She was not a needle worker, but she designed this quilt. It's called The Lazy Man. There's all sorts of imagery here. There's this lightning bolt sort of thing here, which I think represents the power of electrification. And then here there's this music that he likes, you know, that he plays. And then here the police Oh, I didn't even notice that that was a police hand grabbing him. Yeah, you can look this up. You can find this quilt if you want to look at it more. So anyway, this quilt was sewn up by Grace Reynolds Tyler. This quilt now hangs in the headquarters of the Tennessee Valley Authority. And in the year 2000, when I think it was Quilt National, I don't know, but folks got together to choose the 100 best quilts of the 20th century. And this was one of the quilts that was chosen. So many people, you know, are familiar with this image and it's very well loved. She did a few others too in this book. This also, this is a great book, Soft Covers for Hard Times. It's all about the depression. Mary Kay Waldvogel, who lives in, I think she lives in Tennessee still. And then these are some of the other pictures of quilts that she designed. Wow. What I'm seeing is like some of the effects of modernity, like electricity being new and these cranes and these huge big machines. And it really feels almost like, you know, kind of some of the cut work of Bearden a little bit. Yes. Clearly her designs are influenced by Black artists of the time. Absolutely. Jacob Lawrence. That's who people say that they feel that she was really influenced by Jacob Lawrence. Yeah, absolutely. Well, can I just stick one thing in? So we lived in Chicago and my father's brother lived in Washington, D.C. And so we would go and visit him from time to time. But Max and Ruth also lived in Washington, D.C. So we would come across them from time to time. And I remember Max when I was a child because he always wore this sort of rakish beret. He was charming. But I did come across Ruth at one of these reunions. And at that point, she lived to be quite old and she was experiencing some dementia towards the end. But at this particular reunion, I had this book and I brought it to her and I asked her about it. And she, of course, when we start to lose our grip on the present, the past is still clear. And so she and I were able to talk a little bit about it. And it was lovely. What was her reaction when you showed her the quilt in the book? She she said, oh, I haven't thought about that for years. I cannot imagine like making so much beautiful work that I'm like, Oh, yeah, I forgot about that amazing quilt that ended up in one of the best quilts of, you know, in a hundred years. I mean, we're in keyed into quilt world, but, you know, certainly most people are not. And particularly at that time, this this had to be more than 20 years ago. 
that I had this conversation with her. So, you know, quilting wasn't the same as it is now in terms of being, you know, as dominant. People were still thinking of it, and many still do, as some quaint thing that a bunch of women do when they get together. And isn't that cute? And that's just the way that patriarchy is so dismissive, right? If women do it, then who, how valuable could it be, right? Women get to be cooks and men get to be chefs, right? So do you imagine any lessons from your ancestors that you've been able to go back and look and find these things and to see these works of art that your family has produced? Does that guide your own creative practice in the present? You talked about like the way that you bend the Lone Star or the way that you can take something like the basket, which is a traditional pattern and do something else amazing with it. Is there some way in which you want to make sure that you're leaving a great legacy behind, you know, that's not so easy that you don't have to track down. Your work is in museums. You have been on quilt TV shows and quilt videos and speak at quilt festivals and you teach quilt classes. You have a wonderfully robust reputation as well as this great story and presence. Have you thought about that at all as you're kind of doing your work in the present moment? Well, that's definitely something more recently that I I have been focusing on and that I really want to tell this because, you know, I think that we in our youth are not really that interested in what the old folks have to say. I mean, my family has always stressed history and knowing where you come from and knowing who those people are. And so I've always maybe had more of a command of that sort of thing than maybe most people do. But in terms of getting down to those details and in terms of really hearing that history and then saying it again and saying it again, I tell this story all the time. I tell it whenever anybody is sitting down and can't get away. I tell this story all the time. I just want people to remember it. I mean, in terms of quilt practice, working in a series, repetition, because I make the same pattern of quilt again and again, but it's never the same quilt. I think that that repetition is important in storytelling, in history, in art, all of those things, because the story takes on, you know, with each new quilt, it takes on a new little twist. It takes on a new voice. And then the other thing is just talk about history. Tell your children, ask your elders, don't wait because we're dropping like flies, you know? So don't wait. You got to say it while you can still say it. I remember when my grandmother, Rosabelle, and that's Lavinia's daughter, when she was dying from breast cancer and I was in middle school, maybe, And my father gave her a notebook and had her write some things down. And she was writing various things down, not a whole lot and not necessarily terribly connected or coherent because, again, it was her last days. And so whatever was occurring to her, she was writing down. And one of the things that she wrote down was, my father told me that they were never slaves. His parents were a love match. And I didn't know what that meant, right? And she also wrote down Rufus Cleckley. So I started to get on Ancestry and go back and go back. And then I I found Luvinia and Luvinia was married to Esmond Cleckley. And I knew Esmond, it's a family name because my father's brother was named Esmond. So I was like, well, this is definitely us. And so then I'm going back a little bit farther. And then I see that Esmond's father is Rufus Cleckley. Now, Rufus Cleckley was a Scotch-Irish man who emigrated here from Aberdeen, and he took up with a woman of color named Julia. It's not clear whether she was, you know, 100% African or maybe she was African with some indigenous American, but he took up with Julia and had a number of children, four or five children. Uh, And so I'm going back through the records and I I'm going back and I look at the census records from 1860. So in 1860, I could find Rufus Cleckley. Rufus Cleckley was single and there was no, nothing about any children. So then I kept looking and I found the property schedule, the slave schedule. So among Rufus Cleckley's property was a black woman, 26 years old, an eight-year-old mulatto girl, and a two-year-old mulatto boy. So I was like, wow. Then I go to 1870. There's Rufus Cleckley again. Julia has died by this time, but there's Rufus Cleckley. And instead of that two-year-old piece of property, there's a 12-year-old boy who is his son, right? 
written as his son living with Rufus Cleckley. And there's an 18 year old girl who is his daughter. And in the census, it says that Esmond is his son and he is in school and can't remember his sister's name off the top of my head, but she is keeping house for him. So here's this man who in 1860 owned these people because that's the only way that the census could understand them. But in 1870, if they had been his property, they would be, these are his children. They are listed as his children. And she was right by God. Rosabelle was right. She wrote that down. It was just a couple of sentences, but damn it, she was right. And I think that that tells an important story, right? Because in 1860, it wouldn't have been even legal for them to say they were married. Not okay. And actually a lot of black folks would have to buy, at least in Virginia, you had to buy your relatives. And then Virginia also had a limit. You had to move out of the state within a year or everybody gets re-enslaved. So it looks on paper like this person owns enslaved people when in fact it's really their family members. Right. At that time, you know, because of the age of those children, it worked out because he could protect them when they were his property. And then when they got older, they were his children. But yeah, who knows how it would have worked out if it had been 10 years before or you know, whatever. But anyway, I was just amazed that ask the elders, because even if they just write down a little bit of something, you never know what you're going to be able to find out from that little bit of something. You never know. And that little bit of something is really a seed. And in your case, it just blossomed into this absolutely beautiful story that you are also, you're participating in. You're preserving it and you are participating in it and you are promoting it. And that is why you are the star of the Atlanta Quilts show coming up as their master quilter who is going to be teaching people all sorts of amazing things. So what's coming out for you with the show? Like, what are you going to be doing? I'm going to teach a class two times and there is an existing show. If you go to Facebook or to the website for the Atlantic Quilt Show. There's a show that I think it might already be up, but it'll be up during that time. And the Atlantic Quilt Show is particularly focused on African-American quilts and traditions and history and all of that. So it is for us, by us. It's amazing. And I am so glad that we got a chance to talk today. I mean, really, I feel like we need a part two because there's so much that we didn't talk about, but I am so glad that you are going to be having this show and that you're going to be doing your amazing lesson, hopefully proselytizing the good news about paper piecing. I really appreciate having such a strong ally in the paper piecing wars. I absolutely do. I love it. And, you know, it's funny. I never would have thought that it would be something to appeal to me, but it does because it's just a tool. It's just a way to get to that sexy, sharp point. You bend it and make it work for you. You don't have to bend for it. I agree. Y'all, we have been talking with Sarah Bond, and I can tell you that my heart feels full. And I really hope that we're able to walk away with some wonderful lessons that she has shared with us today and look out for her stuff. And I'm going to make sure, I'm going to see if we can release this episode closer to the time that the Atlanta Quilt Show is going to be on so folks can come and see you. But I'm going to include links to all your stuff, links to, I'll put links to the books. I'll put links to your exhibit. Absolutely. And congratulations on that. Thank you. Really, it is incredibly exciting. And I am so glad for it. And I'm so grateful to you and for you, for what you are doing and modeling for us in the ancestral practice of quilting. Like I said, I'm not shutting up. I'm going to keep telling it. So I have an opportunity to hear it again. Thank you so much, Sarah. And we'll be sure to see you and follow you on all the social media and in Atlanta. Thank you so much. And I have been so thrilled to be here with you, Lisa. Thank you. You've been listening to the Stitch Please podcast, the official podcast of Black Women Stitch, the sewing group where Black Lives Matter. We appreciate you supporting us by listening to the podcast. If you'd like to reach out to us with questions, you can contact us at blackwomenstitch at gmail.com. If you'd like to support us financially, you can do that by supporting us on Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, 
And you can find Black Women Stitch there in the Patreon directory. And for as little as $2 a month, you can help support the project with things like editing, transcripts, and other things to strengthen the podcast. And finally, if financial support is not something you can do right now, you can really, really help the podcast by rating it and reviewing it anywhere you listen to podcasts that allows you to review them. So I know that not all podcast directories or services allow for reviews, but for those who do, for those that have like a star rating or just ask for a few comments, if you could share those comments and say nice things about us at the Stitch Please podcast, that is incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. Come back next week and we'll help you get your stitch together. Mm-hmm.